The journey begins at the crossing, where we come as we are, all of us. No matter what season of life we are in, we gather here, young and old, different races, ethnicities, and cultural backgrounds. We exist for all people, not just for ourselves, but for those who haven't been invited, those who haven't been cared for, and those who have walked away from God. We are one church, partnering with others as one family pushing towards the same thing. We believe that Jesus is the hope in a world of darkness, and through his church, the world will find light. We know the choices we make today will change our world for tomorrow. So we have a vision to focus on what really matters, to open our hearts and minds to learn something new, to begin each day with purpose, and to let go of our comfortable living to influence those around us. We have a deep desire to help people discover Jesus and the journey. Our vision is to be the church that Jesus has called us to be, knowing that we have been made to make a difference. Welcome to The Crossing. Good morning, Crossing. Let's stand. Let's sing together. For the joy of the Lord is our strength today.
lift our voices. For our God is faithful. He is with us. No matter what we face, we can raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah.
please go ahead and have a seat. Now we're coming to a time in the service where we remember and reflect on the sacrifice of Christ. This is something that we do here at the Crossing as followers of Jesus each week. Every time we meet, we remember and reflect on his sacrifice. As we just sang, death is defeated. And it's when that happens, when he gave himself for us, that we can no longer worry about death. We don't have to worry about shame, sin, guilt. For he bore those for us on a cross, and that's an amazing miracle. But each day he continues to give us grace that we can choose, that we can accept, that we can live in. So amazing what God has done, what Christ has done for us. And so today we pause, we remember. On the way in, you receive the elements of communion, a little packet with a cracker representing Christ's body broken for you and juice representing his blood shed for you. These next few moments, as you consider Christ and all that he has done, take communion when you're ready. This mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no Tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. There's so much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. There's so much power in your name. 
sing it. God, we believe. God, we believe for it from the impossible. so grateful so grateful for your sacrifice that you made so that we could be free and no matter what we face that you are there with us and sometimes we know that mountains don't move but you are faithful regardless we cling to you no matter what life may bring we thank you that with our with our feet planted on your firm foundation of your truth and your faithfulness that nothing can stand against us. And so we're praying today for a breakthrough in our own lives, in the lives of our family and our friends, that you would move in big ways. God, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Doing great. All right. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here. We've got an amazing day planned for you. Before we continue, why don't you turn to someone and say, hey. What does it mean to get a new pair of shoes? It means to ring. It makes them happy. When I go back to school, I love my new shoes because they look awesome and cool and that I would love to wear them every day. When I have new shoes, I feel happy. New shoes are important for school because we will get glass on our feet. I like new shoes because they're cool. My own, when my old shoes get old and stuff, they cut the back of my heels and go on and get new shoes, they don't. I feel fast and tight with my new shoes. New shoes make me happy. Getting new shoes makes me feel happy because I know that my feet are going to feel comfortable. When I get new shoes, it makes me excited because I get to show my friends at school. Hey, thanks so much for joining us online today. We're so glad that you're here as a part of The Crossing. We're so grateful that you're able to be a part. In just a minute, we're going to jump into our message and our Killing What's Killing You series. This is our concluding week. Before we do that, I want to encourage you, as always, to make sure you log into our app. If you haven't already downloaded it, make sure you do that. This is a place where check in as an online viewer today, as well as let us know about, uh, let, it's a place for you to know about some online steps and some ways you can engage deeper. So make sure that you take advantage of the app. Well, we're wrapping up an online-only series, as I said earlier, Killing What's Killing You. The message today is focused on distraction, so encourage you to lean in, and I'll be back at the end with some final thoughts. Well, welcome everybody online, and thanks for joining us for this series called Killing What's Killing You. So excited to be with you today. Just want you to settle in. I believe today's message will be very important for you. Well, the Europeans, they had kind of an ingenious form of torture. I know that sounds kind of weird, but they had invented it and implemented it in the Middle Ages. It's not just soccer that they now torture us with. In one form of torture that was extremely barbaric, they would take a victim, and believe it or not, they would tie each of their limbs to four different horses. It's not a pretty picture. And then they would pull the victim in four different directions. But it's interesting they had a form, a name for this form of torture. The French called it a distraction. 
I'm pretty convinced you all will agree we are a distracted people. And it's not something that most of us would even claim to be proud of or would even say is healthy for our lives, our hearts, or our souls. But it's true. In fact, I would go as far to say many of us are not just distracted, but we are actually addicted to distraction. Most of us feel like we are constantly pulled in a multitude of directions. You may be watching today and you feel like you're currently experiencing even like a slow death in your life by destruction. And this is why we have decided to do this online series of messages called Killing What's Killing You. And here's our theme verse for this entire series. It comes from John 10.10. It says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Distraction. Distraction is a thief. And left unchecked in our lives, it will leave us frustrated, worried, upset, off course. And eventually, if we're not careful, it has the potential to destroy us. Let me show you an example of this from Jesus' life. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister named Mary, you've probably heard this story, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was, and here's that word, was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. By the way, this is the only time the word distracted is specifically used in the New Testament. Jesus had come over to spend time with Mary and Martha, but Martha, she was being pulled apart using our picture from earlier. She was being pulled apart from him by the many task. It goes on to say, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen, and this is an interesting phrase Jesus uses, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So what exactly is happening in this story that's caused Jesus to basically celebrate one sister and publicly call out another? He says, Martha, Martha, any child knows if your mom rolls out your middle name, it's not a good sign. And if you get your last name involved, it's a really bad day. But the doubling of your name, Martha, Martha, is no compliment for sure. Now, let's be clear here about what he is not doing. He's not highlighting one personality type above another. This is not an Enneagram issue, if you're familiar with that, because there are Mary people and there are Martha people. And it's exactly how God created us. It's not, this is not about one type being better because Mary people, they, they notice the colors and Martha people, I would describe it as they have the compass. So if you're going on a hike, you want a bit of both. Mary would say, isn't it beautiful as we walk around? And Martha would say, hey, it's starting to get dark. We need to head back to our car. Mary is admiring the flowers, and Martha is pointing the way home. We need both. So I want to be clear. Jesus is not shaming Martha because of how she was designed. He understands and loves that. Regardless of our wiring, there are two things that are true, however. We should have the heart to serve, and we should be aware of the danger of distraction. I want to call them what I would say are dinner distractions. They're what causes these Martha moments in us. And dinner distractions are focused on the what, not the why. And they're focused on the urgent, not the essential. Let's start with the why focus. If, if you're the leader in any setting trying to motivate people, it's incredibly important that you don't just focus on the what, but that you start with or focus on the why. When you gather people together to align them and move them forward together, it's the why that's vital to accomplishing the what that you're going after. Martha's problem was not what she did. It was how she did it and that she had missed out and what she had missed out on because of that. She lost her focus on the why. Eugene Peterson, he said it this way. Martha was distracted with much serving. Distracted means not paying attention. It means not having a focus or an anchor, being pulled this way. There's that, there's that picture again. Pulled this way and that way, way by whoever and by whatever. The why, the why is really the focus. And why should this matter? Well, 
Because when you lose your why, you always lose your way. Let me say that again. When you lose your why, you always lose your way. Martha had clearly lost sight of her why. Now, I'm thankful that Martha had brought the guacamole to the party. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And I don't blame her. I mean, if Jesus is in my house, if he's coming over for a picnic, my anxiety would be high. I would want everything to be just right. I can imagine she's working the barbecue grill. She's got chips and salsa on the table. She's trying to keep the ice cream for dessert cold. She's making sure the candles stay burning. The toilet paper matches the shower curtains. She is refilling drinks. She is wanting to be this amazing host, but she's distracted. So Martha comes to Jesus and says, look at my sister. She's no good. She is lazy. And we all have one. Every family has one. If, if you say our family doesn't have that lazy person, you are wrong. If you're not sure who it is, it might be you. You know that person. They never bring anything for the meal except Tupperware and take everything home as leftovers at the end. You see, Martha got so wrapped up in the party that she had planned for Jesus that she forgot about Jesus. And it led to everything we see in Martha, the frustration, the anxiety, the bitterness, the resentment. And she let Jesus hear about it. That's the kind of relationship they they had. She said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I mean, she's a mess at this moment. And we get when we get distracted with so many things, this is where we end up from the mouth of Jesus. It says, you get worried and upset about many things. We're distracted by the what, and we miss the crucial moment of the why. Jesus is right there in the living room, and we're going crazy in the kitchen. Secondly, dinner distractions are also focused on the urgent, not the essential. I think, I think our obsession with the urgent, I'm guilty of it, is killing so many of us. It's killing our focus, our peace. It's killing out our opportunities, our joy, our career. It's killing what could have been, what might have been. Is it just me, or do you ever feel completely pulled apart? And it really is torture. We become tortured souls going this way and that way. It can even be things that are good, but they're distracting and pulling us apart. Maybe you say yes to everyone and everything because you want everyone to be happy. And that's because, man, you have a great, loving, kind heart. But you risk living other people's lives and other people's priorities instead of your own. Greg McEwen said it this way. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will do it for you. So true. We can be urgent. and We can urgently chase more stuff and chase more success and more status. We can be distracted. Maybe as parents, we're working so hard to give our kids more. And that comes from a good place. But as we work to give them more, we're never giving them what they actually desperately need, which is ourselves, because we're distracted. In my own life, I'll occasionally see a time hop photo from the last few years. Maybe it's a a pic of my kid. It's my daughter with her softball glove or sitting at dinner with me or some cool coffee shop looking at our phones, or it's my son with his golf clubs or we're watching a game together. And I'm so glad when I see that picture from those, that time in the past, I'm so glad that I was there. God wants to say to some of the parents watching today, be careful. Don't be distracted. You're missing that. Don't miss that. You can get more money, but you can't get eight years old back. You, can, you can't get that back. Your kid's only going to be 10 or 12 once. I only got this once, and you should refuse to miss it. Why? Because the one thing I can't ever get back is the opportunity to be present as a parent or to be engaged as a spouse. So determine today, I will not be distracted from the essential by those things that seem so urgent. But, it, but listen, before we finish, it's not just the dinner distractions that destroy us. It's also, we have to talk, we have to talk about this. It's the influence of the deci- devices that we're, looking, that we're looking at all the time, that we're looking at while trying to plan the dinner party. There are the device distractions. And we live in an age where all the information in the universe fits into our pockets. So maybe, not me, but maybe some of you are on Pinterest. You're looking up the best things to serve at the dinner party. And we have to get that photo up while also having YouTube running, explaining how to create the most amazing meal while we're FaceTiming our mom to help us not mess up the recipe. Meanwhile, we're also on Instagram seeing that everyone else is having a party that looks way more awesome than ours, and we're not invited. 
So now we're not even present at our thing because we're not at their thing and we're distracted. Here's a number, 2617. That number is what research tells us is the average number of times we touch our phones each day. 2,617. In case you're wondering, there are only 1,440 minutes per day. We touch our phones on average more times than there are minutes in the day. And the irony of me standing in front of you talking about device distraction is not lost on my friends and family who might be hearing this right now. But it's so interesting that our intention span is shrinking and our time on our devices is increasing along with it our level of distraction. And no, this is not the anti-Instagram, kill all your social media talk. Let's all get flip phones. This isn't it. That's not this message. We're happy for the technology that God has given us. This is the message that says, let's use technology and not be used by technology. Our response should be what Jesus told Martha. Choose the better. Mary made the right choice. So why does all this matter? Because diminishing distractions in our lives allows for important interruptions, which can then produce divine opportunities. I want you to look at this for just a moment because Jesus is our model in this. Jesus, of course, was an enigma. I mean, you've heard of indestructible. Well, Jesus was indistractable. He understood and was fully committed all the time to God's given purpose. And he was always interruptible. Sometimes we miss how focused Jesus was. He couldn't let his family keep him from what he knew God wanted him to do. At one point, he was hungry, but it couldn't distract him. He avoided distraction. However, he also saw important interruptions at times as divine opportunities. He's, he allowed at one time his Sabbath, his rest, to be interrupted by a man who desperately needed healing. He was interrupted when a woman touched him who needed healing. Was, he was on his way to an urgent situation to heal a little girl who was desperately sick. That's not distraction. That's interruption. He would put a child on his lap. Remember that? He interrupted his teaching to a crowd hanging on his every word. Henry Blackaby says it this way. Watch to see where God is at work around us and try to join him in his work. That's exactly actually how Jesus described it. He said, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. So I want to invite you today to reflect for a moment on your own life, on your own story, your own narrative. Think about the highlights. My sense would be so many of the highlights would qualify as moments of interruption that became opportunities. Perhaps when you were connected with Christ for the very first time, it was unexpected. Perhaps it was a conversation you had with someone that led to a completely new direction in your life. You had no idea the opportunity was going to happen. It may have seemed like an interruption at that moment, but it turned into a divine opportunity. So many of the most important divine moments of our lives occurred when we aren't planning for them. It happens to me. My best parenting moments rarely happened on a schedule. My best relational moments rarely happened on a schedule. People I love rarely have their moments of crisis when I need to be interrupted on a schedule. Let me see, dear, uh, you're scheduled for a meltdown at 2.30 today, so it's 2.30, go ahead and have it. It's not the way it works. Jesus taught us to live with the same sensitivity that he had to the Spirit's movement around him. And we can do that best if we avoid distractions and we have the potential for powerful interruptions that lead to divine opportunities. So you might ask, what is a divine opportunity? Well, it's when God puts you in the middle of something you had not planned and what transpires is something filled with hope and filled with transformation. Hmm. Now keep in mind, all of this talk about distraction and the destructive traits of it is not about merely being more efficient. It's not about being able to just simply focus more or accomplish more. That's not it, though that will happen. This is the more important part. If you're a follower of Christ, distraction has the potential to actually cause us to miss Jesus and to miss his mission for our lives. And guess what? He actually has one for you. Yeah, around here, we're crazy enough to believe our team, our pastors, what we do, 
We're crazy enough to believe that as focused followers of Christ, we have an added insight into what God is up to in the world. We can actually have an understanding of why we're here, what our lives ultimately need to be about. And it can cause us, as we get that, to clear out the clutter of distraction, which means, as a follower of Christ, the cost of distraction for you and for me is much higher. Jesus said it this way. He said, what does it profit a man if he gains the entire world and yet loses his own soul? So let's get our souls back. A Chinese proverb said it this way. If you don't change your direction, you'll end up exactly where you're going. So the question for you and I today is simple. Based on the direction and the level of distraction you are living with right now, where are you headed? Are you headed to greater peace or higher levels of anxiety? And what about the mission and purpose that God has for your life? How are your distractions impacting that? Is your current direction and level of distraction causing you to miss those opportunities? And listen, if we're not happy, if we're not peace-filled, if we're not focused and we say, well, that's just normal, that's just life the way it is, no. We should reject the idea of normal if what's normal isn't healthy, if what's normal is killing you, if what's normal isn't what God has called us to. Let's get our souls back. It's what I call, let us be focused followers. Listen, focused followers are just different. They reject the norms. Rather than fill their lives with noise, focused followers make time for silence and solitude in which to listen and experience quietness. Rather than allow anxiety to drive them, focused followers learn to depend on a reliable God who invites them to join the strong kingdom work that's already underway. We trust God. Rather than tackle projects under the guise of doing them for God, Focused followers orient themselves to take their cues from God. Rather than working harder, focused followers replenish as hard as they work. That's what we call rest. So let's live a life based on calling and conviction, not addiction. Let's get our soul back. If we've neglected the mission God has for us, let's refocus. Let's get our soul back. If we've missed the interruptions that God's been sending our way because we're moving so fast, let's get our soul back. Let's learn together how to more closely follow Jesus in his way of being open to the people that God brought across his path. Let's learn how to put down our agendas and welcome surprises that weren't on our calendars or to-do lists. Let's learn to stop labeling as interruptions to our work what may actually be God-given opportunities to do his work in that moment. Finally, let's learn to make good plans rooted in our fellowship with God. But may we, I love this, may we hold our plans loosely enough for him to guide us when we implement them. And finally, Jesus has invited us into the reality of an ongoing conversational relationship with God to sit focused at his feet. That's a great word from Alan Fanling in a great book I'd encourage you to track down called An Unhurried Life. Let me sum it up this way. Like Mary, let's choose the better. Choose the better. That's what Jesus said. Let's choose right. Let's kill what's killing us, and let's get our souls back. Let me pray for us today as we wrap up our time of teaching. Father, thank you for those watching today, wherever they're sitting, wherever they're driving, wherever they're sitting and experience this on their device. God, I pray that we would have an honest conversation with ourselves and with you around the distractions that are so relevant and prevalent in our lives. God, that we would be aggressive in moving and killing those, that we wouldn't embrace what may seem to be the norm, but God, like Mary, we would choose the better, no matter our personality or the way you've wired or wonderfully created us. God, thank you for those watching today. We ask that you would just give them strength and courage for the week ahead, and we ask it in your name. Amen. Well, here I am again as your post host. Thank you so much for joining us online. Today concludes our online only series, Killing What's Killing You. We're grateful each and every week that you've joined us. Next week, we're back um, in person and online tracking together. We have a special three-week summer series around spiritual formation, some of the habits and disciplines in our spiritual life that we can apply during this summer that, we can, um, that will really help accelerate and grow our faith. So we want to encourage you to join us, 9-11 a.m. 6 p.m. Pacific. And as always, we love our online viewers wherever you're watching from. If you are local to Las Vegas, love to have you in person at one of our physical campuses, either at Windmill or at Midtown. We're thinking about you. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next weekend. God bless.